Welcome back to the C Block of We Talk News. I'm Elena Pinto. If you are a regular viewer of our news show, you know that the state of Missouri has set all sorts of records for sales. Many of their policies and regulations are unique to that state, including public consumption that can vary from town to town. When it comes to the Show Me State, we have Brandon Jones with our Missouri Report. Hey everybody, it's Brandon Jones with B Green Distribution with Missouri Canner Support, the Weed Talk News. And yes, we've already seen some of the rescheduling uh, news come out and change some things here in Missouri. I've already seen layoffs are already started to happening. And we've just seen the anticipation of the change that might come with this rescheduling process. Because if you don't know here, it's a finite market. There's so there's only a certain number of licenses that were released. Those license holders are now a little bit worried that that means that opens the door to other people to be able to produce cannabis here in the state of Missouri and sell it legally. So they're starting to lay off and do some little thinking about what's going to have to happen with their processes here in the state of Missouri. Others are cutting back on just their expenditure. Uh, I see some accounts not spend as much on swag and other items just because they're trying to make sure that they don't get overextended in this period that they have kind of flux and not know what's going on. Another big news that happened here in Missouri, the cannabis science community came in and just took over downtown Kansas City. The Marriott in downtown was taken over by scientists and all sorts of different uh, people in the technology industry that half of them didn't know what they were talking about as far as cannabis consumption, but they've got some really cool ideas as far as technology. And I don't think I've been in a room with that many bi microbiologists since college. <laughs> if you don't know, I have a math and physics background, so I used to hang out with the nerds all the time. And it was kind of cool to be back in that environment and see all those people are now trying to find their way into cannabis and seeing the cool technologies they come out with. Obviously, it's Mother's Day weekend. What a big shout out to all the mothers out there and everybody that's doing all those to help raise their children and to just, you know, do everything that, that they can to be, be, be there for their families. My mother is my angel on earth. So if you don't know my story, I was a really bad car wreck, went through a really bad opioid addiction. And if any of those that have been addicted to anything knows that you become a user of not just that particular item, but you become a user of everyone in your life. And I took way too much advantage and put my mother and the rest of my family through hell for a very long period of time until finally, you know, I got off that opioids and found a new true plant medicine that helps me. So thank you so much, mom. I love you. Thank you for always being there for me, even through those horrible times when I was not a good human. And so thank you so much for being the best grandmother that you are, too. So, again, I'm Brandon Jones with B Green Distribution. This is the Missouri Cannabis Fort for Weed Talk News. They edu educated and medicated. And happy Mother's Day, all mothers. See you next week. Now let's head out west to get caught up with two of the oldest regulated states, Oregon and Washington State. Here's Matthew Friedlander in Washington and Marianne Kersaji in Oregon. I'm Marianne from Alibi with this week's Oregon Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. News out of Oregon this week includes a landmark legal ruling. Attorney Kevin Jacoby won a case challenging the immunity of Oregon's cannabis regulatory agency employees. There have been stories over the years of OLCC inspectors harming people, property, and reputation. Until this ruling, those government employees were granted immunity from any consequences of their actions. This left licensees in a difficult position. We'll see if this ruling is challenged or not, but this is great news, putting some guardrails on the powers of agency inspectors. Per Jacoby Law, this ruling underscores the maxim that nobody is above the law. And next, publicly traded company Kaya Holdings announced this week that in addition to its cannabis licenses in Oregon, it has received a license to administer psilocybin products in Oregon. The psilocybin market has been hampered by high costs due to stringent regulations, so hopefully they can find a way to provide psilocybin services at affordable rates. And finally, intoxicating hemp products continue to make news. While not allowed for sale in Oregon, they can be manufactured and shipped to other states. This is a hot topic with many strong opinions. The regulations surrounding this may change with this year's Farm Bill. A number of Oregon operators, including Utopia, have launched hemp products to expand their product offerings. That's the Oregon Cannabis Report for this week. I'm Marianne with Alibi for Weed Talk News. Hi, I'm Matthew Friedlander, coming to you from The Collective in Seattle. 
uh, with this week's Washington State Cannabis Report for We Talk News. Uh, pardon the, the noise in the background, but we just finished up with our ninth annual Cannabis Summit uh, here for the Cannabis Alliance. Uh, we had a great conversation about all things cannabis, uh, equity in the cannabis space, descheduling, rescheduling, uh, the intersection of hemp and cannabis, uh, a whole lot of things. It was a, it was a great day. Uh, there will be lots of information up on the Cannabis Alliance website, so you can check out that at thecannabisalliance.us. Um, that's what I've got for you this week. Uh, I think my brain's a little bit fried. Uh, we have been talking since 9 o'clock this morning. It's about 6.30. Um, so I'm going to sign off for today. But that's what I've got for you this week uh, for the Washington State Cannabis Court for We Talk News. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Cannabis advocates in Texas are disappointed that the city of Lubbock rejected a measure that would have decriminalized small amounts of cannabis in that city. It wasn't even close, with 65% of voting residents rejecting the ordinance. Now that state's attorney general, Ken Paxton, is starting legal action against five towns in Texas that have already voted to decriminalize small amounts of cannabis, including the capital, Austin. With more from the Lone Star State, here's Lisa Williams. I'm Lisa Williams, founder of the Toke Agency, with the Texas Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. Hold on to your hats, we got the Texas Cannabis Roundup coming at ya. Last weekend, voters in Lubbock overwhelmingly rejected, by a margin of 30 percentage points, 65% opposed the measure, 35% supported it, to decriminalize possession of less than four ounces of marijuana. The proposed reform drew loud opposition from local conservatives. Texas has helped fuel New Mexico's cannabis industry. While the Texas legislature continues to reject legalized cannabis and the millions of tax revenue it could provide, West Texans continue to flock to their neighbors in New Mexico. Since New Mexico went wreck in April of 2022, the dispensaries just across the Texas border have seen a record $71 million in sales. Local dispensaries in Sunland Park, New Mexico estimate a whopping 80% of their current customers hail from Texas. A few Texans have been reported to say, hey, Texas legislature, get with the times. In other Texas cannabis news, Austin-based Goodblin, one of three approved suppliers under the Texas Limited Medical Marijuana Program, on Tuesday opened its first permanent location in San Antonio, Texas. Goodblend has current locations in Austin and Plano and looking to expand to Houston soon. Under the current regulations, supplies cannot be stored at retail sites, so they must be shipped back to the Austin headquarters nightly. I'm Lisa Williams, founder of the Toke Agency, with the Texas Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. The state of Vermont might be revoking a grow license from a company that has been cited for fungicide. It's in their flower. Holly Cannabis had their products seized from dispensaries and shut down their grow until the State Cannabis Commission can inspect. This is the second time Holland Cannabis has been infected. We know there's always something going on in the 702 area code. That's the area code for Las Vegas. Here's Tina Tasaka with the Nevada Report. I'm Tina Tasaka with 420 Technologies, and this is the Nevada Report for Weed Talk News. Beginning on June 5th, 2023, and concluding on October 2nd, 2023, the CCB, Cannabis Compliance Board, conducted a routine audit and investigation of a cultivation. There were a total of seven violations, and each were levied with a fine from the CCB. These infractions included the following. Number one, 
the cultivation did not have a business license for the city of Las Vegas. Although located in Clark County, the cultivation allegedly sold products to dispensaries in Las Vegas. The CCB suggested a $20,000 fine for this, plus another $10,000 whammy for an unintentional false statement. Number two, certain security cameras were not functioning properly and the security malfunction log was not filled out. The fine, 20,000. Number three, there were errors allegedly between metric and entries on the clone logs. The harvest logs did not have the final yield weight of usable cannabis in grams. The CC fine, 7,500. Other infractions included expired agent card, waste logs not reported properly, visitor logs not properly filled out, and inventory reports not filled properly. In totality, the fines suggested by the CCB are 80,000. The Cannabis Compliance Board, State of Nevada, has filed against 1212 LLC for these violations April 22nd, 2024. Hey, UNLV students, alumni, and fans, great news out of UNLV. This spring, UNLV announced the five reasons to be proud rebels, and number three was the establishment of the Cannabis Policy Institute. Southern Nevada is an emerging center for cannabis industry with roughly one billion in annual legal cannabis sales and new consumption lounges opening and more to follow this year and beyond. This institute is in position to lead cannabis policy discussions relative to the state and country. Leading the institute is alumna Rihanna Durrett. Well, I say go Rebels. That's it for the 702. I'm Tina Tasaka with 420 Technologies and Weed Talk News. The last time we checked in on Ohio, it seemed like that state was making progress on launching their adult use program. So let's see if anything has been delayed. Here's Harry Bernstein. This is Harry Bernstein with Verde Compliance Partners and the Ohio Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. In our last report, we discussed how Ohio's adult use cannabis program is on the fast track to becoming a reality with the state required to award dispensary licenses by September, 2024. This week, we have exciting updates to share along with some potential challenges. Ohio is still on base to begin, excuse me, pace to begin taking applications for adult use dispensaries in June and has created a fast track process to grant medical cannabis licensees an adult use permit. This could lead to a faster than anticipated opening of the adult use market, with some speculating that stores could be open as soon as this July 4th. However, the president of the Ohio Senate has indicated that they would consider amending the law, changing tax rates, and reducing or eliminating home grow. These potential changes could impact the implementation timeline and the accessibility of cannabis for Ohio residents. Additionally, there are still plenty of questions to be answered before the market can open such as THC limits and packaging rules. One option being discussed is to allow adult use licensees to sell medical cannabis products for adult use. While this could speed up the process, it also raises concerns about potential supply shortages for medical patients. Despite these challenges and potential legislative changes, Ohio is making significant progress toward implementing its voter approved adult use cannabis program. With the potential for current medical cannabis licensees to obtain adult use licenses and start serving customers soon, Ohio's positioning itself as a national leader in the cannabis industry. As the state continues to work out the details of the adult use market and navigate potential amendments to the law, we can expect to see new jobs, tax revenue, and economic growth in Ohio. Stay tuned for more updates on this exciting, this exciting and evolving development. This is Harry Bernstein with Verde Compliance Partners for the Ohio Report for Weed Talk News. And finally tonight, sex and weed. I got your attention, didn't I? So, is sex better when you are high? Well, there is a new study that concludes that not only is sex more intense when you are under the influence, it can actually enhance or help women to orgasm. 
it's in the news this week because Ohio is considering adding female orgasm disorder to its list of qualifying medical conditions for its medical program. The 10-page study in the Journal of Sexual Medicine concludes that among those who suffer from FOD, 71% of women reported it helped them climax. Another 67% said it improved satisfaction from achieving an orgasm. So keep that in mind and talk with your partner before anxiety takes over a healthy part of adult life. That will do it. For this week's Weed Talk News, I'm Elena Pinto. Remember, it is a whole new world of weed out there. Use it responsibly. We are pro-cannabis media.